And they do have this little food garden out the front, this little kitchen garden. But it's not doing that well because there's this whopping great gum tree overshadowing it on the street. And, um, but anyway, the garden's actually really being managed by the guy next door. So he, because he's got the green thumb and, and he prunes the grapes and sort of manages it all for them. But they do like to just sort of go out and pick a few herbs out of the, uh, the garden. So they've got a bit of a, a garden happening there. Well, actually, they've got a berry patch right down the back as well that's in a shaded corner. Um, and uh, so that's, that's all really very complementary production happening between the, the two places. Well, look, the, uh, the gum tree on the street has died mysteriously and, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, sort of copied and planted fruit trees. And then we've got nut trees down the driveway. And uh, wait a minute, what's that? Oh, the hill's hoist has made a return. <laughs> See, there's Hill's voice, and even a bit of lawn. Uh, now, what was the story there? Oh, that's right. Um, the young mums got together and sort of had a rebellion because the babies are sort of at the crawling stage, and they reclaimed a bit of uh, lawn for the, the babies to crawl around on. And anyway, it was a good place to put the Hill's hoist. So Hubby had to give up some of his vegetable production. So he's really crammed for space there uh, now. And, um, but he's, um, he's cranking along, grow, trying to increase the, the production on the limited area he's got. And he's got a big new compost system up the back where they can drive in and unload and sort of do this large scale composting because he's really uh, trying to produce as much as he uh, can out of the place. And uh, as I said, they don't have much money, but they noticed how incredibly good the greenhouse was next door and thought, well, they could do that to their place too. So they've put a, a little greenhouse that um, acts as a, a passive air heater and of course he's growing more plants in it. Though she's always complaining that his potting mixes are uh, where she wants to change the baby in um, on the sunny days in winter. But anyway, it's all, it's all happening. So the people count in Aussie Street is up to 15. It's, things are turning around. There's a lot more economic activity happening, both in the household level and um, a little bit happening at the commercial uh, level. And so where can this process go next? Well, this place is being identified as a sort of a bit of a working model of the sort of things that could be happening in suburbia. And they've gradually got some tentative negotiations with the um, uh, the building inspectors, of course the house was all fully approved but some of the other things uh, you know, are now getting retrospective um, <coughs> approval because they're being acknowledged that they're actually sort of quite good ideas. So that was a bit delicate to negotiate that with the bureaucrats but it sort of is moving on. Where can this process go next? Well, there's already other people copying this model but what about in Aussie Street? Well, at number four, the territory looks a little bit bleak. You've got all that concrete, and I think they put reinforcing in it when they poured all that concrete driveway. Um, there's a, a sort of an opportunity. How can you turn that stormwater detention tank into a sort of some sort of water recycling system? But anyway, all of these points are a bit academic because the owner is someone who lives. Um, 500 kilometres away, and the tenants are sort of really, well, the teenagers here are total couch potatoes, you know, that, um, and it's a bit bleak. But maybe that'll have to wait until social and economic conditions change a bit further before number four sort of really becomes part of the uh, action. Not a total lost cause, but uh, a difficult one. But over at number one, the elderly couple are still hanging on. <laughs> now, the young mum next door, she actually was doing some home help for them under a scheme that the council had um, where you know, people got sort of paid to sort of help elderly neighbours and whatever, but that came to an end when the council decided that 
you know, these people didn't necessarily have any qualifications to actually uh, look after old people, so the risk management uh, team said that probably <laughs> going to um, So, but anyway, they're sort of really on quite good terms with these people, and they're sort of doing that anyway. And, of course, Hubby is really um, needing more space for his veggie production system. So he moves into the backyard and, of course, provides the old people with their, um, their veggie box and suddenly he's got triple the space to um, expand. So, of course, the point of this little story is really just to show that it is possible to retrofit our suburban landscapes in a way that's enormously adaptable to the crises that are coming on us, the twin crises of climate change and peak oil. That these crises are coming so fast that a lot of the long-term ideas about how we will build, model new ecological towns and cities, and then from those models we'll use that to totally revamp our existing cities, well, we should have all started that in the 1970s. It's too late for that. That is a 50-year project. We don't have 50 years. We're going to be stuck with what we've got. And I really want to point out how the behaviour change part of this is almost more important than any of the technical solutions. The technical solutions are simple. They need to be brought together. But it's really the people and the behaviour uh, change stuff that's the central part of this. I think there's a few imperatives to really kick-starting this relocalisation of our communities and economies. I mean, I think the first is to network for inspiration and information. And to get producing and support local producers, not just of food, but anyone who is producing something that is potentially useful and usable um, in the local area, we should support. We need to involve kids and their friends including in subversive, fun ways. <laughs> we need to make contact with neighbours and barter. Build those relationships with people you don't necessarily um, see eye to eye to or you have sort of different um, attitudes and approaches, but really make that contact. Review needs and reduce consumption. The possibility of sharing your place taking in a border. I suggested to council staff today that the single most important thing that perhaps they could do along these sort of lines would be a campaign to encourage people to take in a border as a way of the most effectively boosting your community and reducing environmental impact at the same time as helping pay off your mortgage. People don't have that information. There's, that this issue of household size is the critical one. Sharing your car, carpooling and picking up hitchhikers, breaking down the barriers of fear that exist in our communities that are leading to progressively more and more isolation and totally dysfunctional behaviours like the the traffic jam at the schools that has become the, the norm. Creatively work around regulatory impediments. Now I can say that I gave this presentation um, uh, in Western Australia at an event that was opened by the Minister of Transport, uh, Alana McTiernan, who's one of the uh, Australian politicians who's very up to speed on peak oil. Not only did she open the event, she stayed for Richard Heinberg's presentation and she then stayed for my presentation. The idea of paying off debt and working from home, big challenges but really important ways of, of people breaking the cycle. And finally, to retro, retrofit for the future rather than speculative gain. Thank you.